Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jewel, and I'm the executive director of the Daphne Zeppos Teaching Endowment, uh, which is an endowment full of uh, wonderful donations that we use to give away two scholarships annually with hopes to incorporate a third in the next couple of years. Um, and then what it does is it encourages people in the um, food um, world, particularly in cheese, to do some research, to travel, to do whatever they want based on their own curriculum of choice. Um, and then the goal is to bring back some sort of education that you can then share in different modalities. So either in actual formal presentations and talks and lectures, um, in written word, in video content, uh, whatever it is that you suit. So the DZRA, the Daphne Zeppos Research Award, is one of those awards. And that one was launched in 2020, um, but with uh, recipients coming in 2021. So it's kind of a brainchild of 2020 when we weren't able to travel and give out our Daphne Zeppel's Teaching Award, which does require travel. And so in 2021, we uh, officially launched it, accepted applications, and had the incredible pleasure of being able to give this money away to Mary Casella who are you are here tonight to hear from. Um, and so she is our debut DZRA recipient. <laughs> Uh, she did a wonderful job presenting this at the American Cheese Society Conference in Portland, Oregon. And so she is here tonight to share with you her research, uh, her incredibly inspiring stories of women in dairy, both old and more recent um, contemporaries. And so without any further ado, I am going to turn this over to Mary. Thank you for joining me this evening. Um, I think most of you know me uh, either in real life or virtually. And I'm really honored to have you all with me this evening. Let's get to it. As Rachel said, I have some questions proposed for you this evening that, you know, uh, take a look at them now and have a think while I'm sharing my research with you. And hopefully we can discuss them at the end of the evening. Leave these up for a second. So this past ACS, we celebrated the 10 year anniversary of the Daphne Zeppos Teaching Endowment. And I have to say, I've been thinking a lot recently about what it means to me to have this opportunity to learn and then to teach and share what I've found and to continue this cycle of mutual education. Having heard of Daphne's legacy from those who knew her and her passion for mentorship and excitement for life and learning, I'm so thankful and honored to have been given this chance and ultimately this role as educator. Um, and I doubt that it's not lost on anyone, the significance of talking about women in this industry in, honest, in honor of Daphne and her legacy. It's been just over a year since I began working on my project, and with every page turned and read and every woman I've talked to, a new path arrives to go down, and I have no doubt that this will be a lifelong pursuit. In fact, it seems every day something uh, pops up into life that seemingly would not relate to the work I'm doing, but somehow does relate. So that's been exciting to see. Um, I sought out this project as there seemed to be a real deficit in resources dedicated to and focused on the role of women in the world of dairy. Much to my delight, there is in fact a lot of information out there in regards to women in dairy. You just have to do some digging and I'm more than happy to put in that work. As the session title states tonight, I will be focusing on the work women do in and for dairy through sharing individual stories. At the end of my talk, I hope it leaves you thinking, excited, and just as eager as I am to keep the momentum going on showing a light on all the amazing women in this industry. It's still strange for me to think that more and more people have heard my name and know about my work and to have people who don't know me give me such applause. This great cheese community can be so welcoming. And while it is a big network of people, it can feel like a family and it's one that I'm happy to call home. It's been about six years since I got my start at Campbell Cheese and Grocery, which is now Campbell's and Co. in Brooklyn, owned by sisters Alana and Erin Campbell. Having no cheese experience, Alana and Erin took a chance on my interest to learn and they gave me the room and tools to grow during my time there. It is at Campbell's that I discovered my passion for cheese and its history and culture. And ultimately it is what has led me to be where I am today, both in my career and having this platform to speak. I met some of my closest friends behind that counter and I'm sure many of you know the joy that comes from working with and amongst women. In my comparatively brief cheese career, I have had the pleasure to work with many women. The past few years have been peppered with various experiences within the industry. Each one though, marked by inspiring, strong and intelligent women I've met. 
Most recently, I had the opportunity to work with nine uh, sorry, I had the opportunity to work nine wonderful months as an affiner alongside the women of Crown Finnish Caves. Not only was this a truly unique experience, but it solidified what I already knew about working amongst great women. That desire to learn when I started at Campbell's has never ceased, and it was in my effort to learn everything I could about the history and deep connection between women and dairy that led me to apply for the Daphne Seppos Research Award. At the point of my proposal, I was at a loss to find any resource that I felt truly got to the depths of this history or that fully expressed just how impactful women had been to the industry and continue to be. Yes, the names of major players get mentioned and highlighted here and there, uh, but I was left wanting. I'm pleased to say that there are an abundance of resources out there speaking to the history of women in this industry, but as I've already mentioned, it required some digging. And what's more, there are innumerable women in dairy, each with their own story, shared in unique experience, and so open to sharing. Even if there were no presentations or this all ended when I closed my laptop tonight, which it won't, I would be forever grateful for this opportunity purely on the basis of how many women and men have reached out to me with encouraging and kind words about my project and how many women I have met and interacted with through this work. My only hope is to stay steadfast in this work and bring attention to those who may go unnoticed. This is Nancy Tabor Richards. This is a dairy maid. I first met Nancy in 2008 in Trumansburg, New York when I was a photography student at Ithaca College. Long before I had even the slightest idea that I would work in cheese, I chose Nancy as my subject for a photojournalism project. As I grew up in the rural horse and cow country of Northwestern New Jersey, I'd always had a deep admiration for farmers in the Finger Lakes region, not being that different from where I grew up. I wanted my project to highlight the work of dairy farmers in the area. A contact through neighboring Cornell University put me in touch with Nancy and I spent a few weeks getting to know her and photographing her while she worked. I was not cut out to be a photojournalist, even as I've conducted this research, I have found my shyness getting the better of me at times. But my poor journalism skills were no indicator of my interest in and admiration for Nancy. She was a one woman powerhouse making farmstead cheese from the milk of her family's cows. She was a businesswoman, a wife and a mother. At the time, I didn't have the knowledge or skills to ask deeper questions about her work, but I keenly observed with my lens. Meeting Nancy has stuck with me all these years, on one hand, because my photos of her were some of my favorite from my uh, school year work, and on the other, because I've always revered her strength, skill, and kindness. Not to mention, once I did start working in cheese, I couldn't believe the foreshadowing. I introduce you to Nancy first because her story encapsulates one version of what it is to be a modern day dairy maid, and also, illustrates quite closely what the life and role of the dairy maid of yore was like. Nancy made and sold cheese produced from the milk of her family's herd, which provided a source of income for her family, sustenance for them, and contributed to the agriculture and economy of her community. All the while taking care of her family through traditionally ascribed domestic duties of women. Women's work has undoubtedly been undervalued and overlooked over time deemed to be not true work, lacking in skill and expertise, and one unwarranting of proper compensation, if any at all. Not be taken for granted though, just how important women's work is to the very success of our societies, whether we deem their labor as work or not. When we look at the work of women within the world of dairy, we can clearly see how these sentiments express themselves. And I believe you'll recognize them in the stories I share. Across industries and around the world, there is still work that is considered to be suitable and appropriate for women and that which is not. Since it was considered to be exclusively the work of women for nearly 600 years, with some exceptions, of course, dairying as defined as a business of operating in dairy or conducting work related to dairy products is an especially useful lens through which to further explore the value of women's work. It is not to say that these contemporary times, women are as overlooked as we once were, but there is still so much room for more recognition. 
I am a woman in dairy and I have experienced and continue to experience firsthand some of these shortcomings. And I've witnessed and heard from many of my peers similar ones. It is for their stories and voices that may go unknown and unheard that I'm up here today. Because after each of these interactions, I was left inspired and motivated to keep doing this work. And as the saying goes, a woman's work is never done. I want to give you a sense of just how deeply women are tied to this work without diving into a full on history lesson by taking a close look at the word dairy. The meaning and usage of words hold great importance. And once I learned of the origins of dairy and dairy maid, I found it hard to separate this new knowledge from how I perceived this work. We all know various definitions of the word dairy, depending on the context in which it is used. What you might not have known, like I didn't, is that it has its roots in the naming of women's work. Dairy stems from the old English day, which meant female servant, woman who handles food in the household, housekeeper. By around 1200 day, when attached to maid, specifically meant woman in charge of milking and making butter and cheese, dairy maid. When combined with the suffix airy, dairy came to be understood as a place for making butter and cheese or a dairy farm. Then later, by the 1550s, milkmaid was also used to describe a woman employed in a dairy or one who makes, sells, and sells butter, milk, and cheese. Dairy is still the word we use to describe these products we make, sell, consume, this entire food group and industry. Dairy made, however, is a somewhat antiquated term that slowly faded from use as women were gradually pushed out of the forefront of this work. And while it is a succinct descriptor, it has lost its heft as a title and frankly, might come across as a little cutesy or condescending. I would not think it wholly unsurprising if any female cheesemaker, seller, or dairy farmer today balked at being called either a dairy maid or a milk maid. But there is great meaning in these terms and we would all be wise to consider their foundation. There is no dairy without women's work. And I would, with the utmost respect, call any woman in this business a dairy maid. While great changes have occurred over the past 100 years or so, historical and sociological ideas around gender and gender roles still persist. There are of course easily made connections between women, gender and dairy on a biological level, but I will be focusing more on the sociological aspects, meaning predominantly held and prescribed social ideas about women. As we've learned with the root of the term dairy, this word used to be fully accepted as the, this work used to be fully accepted as the realm of women. And Deborah Fink's Not to Intrude, a Danish perspective on gender and class in 19th century dairy, she makes it abundantly clear that Danish men wanted nothing to do with milk or milking. Sentiments such as it was creepy for a male to milk cows and that it was a matter of dignity and gender identity were socially upheld even by women. It is not until around the 19th century that we begin to see a shift in the regenderization of dairy work as men step in and take over. It is necessary and important to talk about women's domestic work in relation to dairy work because the two went hand in hand for decades as making value added pro dairy products was woven into the rest of a woman's work day. In general, women's work in the home is not seen as true work. Scholar and activist Silvia Federici speaks of reproductive labor, not in regards to literal childbirth, but rather all the work women do that is sustaining the family and home. Work that is essential to our societies, but largely unrecognized or compensated by our economy. Women's labor is free labor. Even outside the home and into the work sphere, in our case, the dairy, women were held to standards one maid hold the mistress of the home to. As Deborah Valenz makes clear, a great responsibility fell on the shoulders of the housewife and her abilities as a dairy maid. And there were many thoughts on the qualities which a good housewife and dairy maid should have. An able dairy maid or mistress should be clean and efficient. One cannot help but think of the saying, a clean home is a happy home. As women were being pushed out of the dairy, they were ever more encouraged to hone those attributes so long as they kept them to the oversights of the household especially middle and upper class women. I'd like to introduce you to a woman who melded both the ideal of a head dairy mistress in the ways of a woman well-versed in the domestic arts. 
This is Ada F. Howie. In 1925, she became the first woman to serve on the Wisconsin Board of Agriculture. After inheriting her family's farm in Elm Grove, Wisconsin in 1897, at the age of 45, Ada would embark on a lifelong commitment to agricultural reform. At a time when society was heavily divided into man's world and women's world, business, power, money, versus family and home, Ada arguably brought the finest female virtues to the farmlands of Wisconsin, and she gained widely held praise and recognition for her dairy farming practices that utilized distinctly feminine values and practices. Ada invested careful time and thought into taking over Sunny Peak Farm. She immersed herself in learning about various breeds and created a business plan that would start small, allowing the farm to grow only as the profits from the two original cows would allow. Author Nancy Unger notes that this occurred during a time when women were compelled into activism. Seeing men of business seek high profit over morality, Ada wanted to create an approachable farm model that others could follow and succeed with, and she criticized men's mindless waste, hurriedness, and profit-driven ideas. Smaller was better in her mind. It was not just Ada's feminine wiles that led to her recognition and widespread study of her methods and innovations. Her approach to farming, rooted in domestic principles, had reason and practicality behind it and real calculable results. From those two original cows, Ada soon was raising what would be the largest herd of purebred jerseys in Wisconsin. She was also a proponent of the idea that well taken care of and happy cows would yield more milk. It was not just the nature of a good breed, but also the nurture shown towards them. While perhaps unconventional, her methods such as playing music for her cows became regarded as sound practice. Keeping in line with how a mistress would run her home, Ada eschewed that the dairy should be as clean as a champion kitchen. And she led by that sentiment, instilling sanitary practices 30 years before any kind of legislation on sanitary milk production existed. The barn was scrubbed weekly and all milkers washed their hands before milking to prevent the spreading of the disease. And not just a, a sanitary measure, but again, caring for the comfort of her cows, they were not tied, but allowed ample standing room in the ability to lay down. Ada made a point to present her achievements as a, as a result of conventional notions of femininity in women's work. However, it was easy for some to mock the way she treated her cows and outfitted her farm as silly and trivial. But the fact is these domestic practicalities merged with work life quite spectacularly. And for the remainder of her life, Ada traveled around the country, even to Europe, speaking about agriculture and homemaking. Ada lived during a time when if you were of a particular class, women were expected to occupy themselves with making the home comfortable and beautiful. Certainly by this time, dairy work was seen as less and less suitable for women. With Ada's story, we can see how her feminine and domestic experience which men so badly wanted to oust from dairying was in fact a crucial part of her success. This blurring line between domestic work and farm work is especially notable in dairying, as not only was dairy work literally done just outside of or next to the home in some cases, but this was done in relation to and timed around all other housework. To recall reproductive labor, this other housework included everything from caring for children and the elderly to mending and making clothes, and of course, cooking. There is plenty to criticize in this social structure where women are often relegated to maintaining the home as well as seeking personal careers and other employment. But it should be noted that the dairying path has also been sought in a positive light exactly for its proximity to the family. As I mentioned, I grew up in rural New Jersey. And while I was surrounded by dairy farms, I was completely unaware if cheese was being made in the state. So when I learned about Jess Clark, of nonchalant cheese in Vernon, New Jersey, I knew I had to meet her. It was not very long once we got talking before Jess frankly stated that she had always wanted to be a mother and that agriculture was a path that allowed her to raise and provide for her children in a meaningful way. In fact, her children are very much a part of her day-to-day -day activities on the farm. Her sons, Zeke and Jonah, joined us while we talked and walked around the farm. And it was apparent just how involved Jonah, the eldest, was. I posed to Jess what it is that she thinks draws women to this work. And is it anything inherent in women, whether socially or biologically? 
just does believe that a want and need to provide family is a certain is certainly part of why she does the work. She reflected on the traditional nature of the setup she and her partner have. She joined him on his farm where he was already doing produce and eggs, but not dairy. He already had his work and was happy to have her join him, but he didn't want anyone stepping on his toes, so to speak. He was not going to make changes to something that was working for him. For Jess, animal husbandry and dairy was already her passion and biggest interest, but it became quite literally her place. We both noticed the distinct realms her situation mimicked and concluded that historically, having the cow in the barn that was not so far from the house and then cheese making was in the house, it all just made it more accessible for the woman and thus it was a natural flow of work life. Just also reflected on how distinctly the experience of being a mother has influenced how she thinks about her work. The first time she milked a cow, she was nursing a baby. It was so powerful for her that an animal was going to let her handle her udder and share her milk. It was profound in such a way that she's not sure that a man would understand in the same capacity. Amongst the conversations I've had with women, I've noticed this recognition of the distinctly female experience and how it lends itself to empathy with animals. I would note that I believe this is not just biological, but qualities women have that are socialized into us from an early age. Jess was still nursing at the time of our conversation and said that when she brings the cows in for milking, she'll drizzle molasses on the hay. Does she think the cows need molasses and is it even enough that it's going to do anything? No. She added though, that she's making milk and does she need chocolate at four o'clock? Yes, she does. She reflected on and laughed about the paradox of this treat, considering that she feels so passionately about having her herds on grass and on pasture. And then she gives, and then she goes and gives a glug of molasses, but she can justify it in her own way. As we continued to talk, I enjoyed hearing the way in which Jess thought about her work. She didn't really learn cheese making until she got her own animals, which at the start, she was milking a Jersey and three goats just for the family. And from there, she started with cheese making books, but as she was reading them, what she was learning just didn't feel right to her. To quote Jess, People have been making cheese before there were thermometers, before there were clocks, she said. No one was following the recipes when they had to start a fire to do the laundry for their 12 children. With this ethos, Jess set out making her own recipes after coming to the understanding that it's just A plus B plus C and any number of variables. At the onset of the industrialization of cheesemaking, this way of thinking was one of the very things that men would use to discredit women's abilities to make quality cheese. Cheesemaking is not even really what just likes to do, in fact. It's more of an ends to a means of being able to work with animals. That, and she enjoys eating cheese, but laments that as a farmer, you don't really have the funds to buy someone else's cheese, so you make it. At Nonchalant, they make raw milk cheese from their herd of about 30, cow 30 jerseys, give or take. Milking happens once a day, first in the morning, and goes straight to the creamery and is immediately turned into cheese. Jess notes that her creamery, which was not by her own design, is of mismatched sizes of equipment, far too large of a vat, etc., and they just use hot plates in five-gallon pots. Whey from the day before is used to coagulate the milk and she will only intentionally inoculate if she wants a particularly bloomy rind. We bonded over the great agriculture of New Jersey and how wonderful it was that Jess was doing a unique thing amongst her community where there is a lot of produce, beef and fluid milk dairying, but nothing quite like what she's doing here. It is no news to anyone here that farming is difficult, especially on a small scale. Jess has had her fair share of troubles from the local government. There was no problem getting a license to milk and make cheese from the state, but the country handles licensing for the sales side of things, and that was very difficult for her. Jess has been making cheese for five years, and this was the first year they were able to have on-site sales at the store. Her first obstacle was the county health department, and then she ran into issues with the town because the zoning department said she was, wasn't selling for retail. Looking back frustratedly, she commented that she was only going to make the town better and more interesting with her business and couldn't understand all this red tape. In the end, 
Jess had to essentially create two businesses, one that produces cheese and then one that buys and resells it already packaged. Jess's story resonated with me in the way it spoke to the life of motherhood, caring for a family and domestic roles. I can't help but think of feminism in the back to the land movement and how that spurred the resurgence of artisanal cheese making in large thanks to women. Arguably, Jess manages her business in a way that is best that best serves her family. And through this work, she is not only supporting her family, but her community and the environment. An important aspect of how we talk about women's work is the, the distinguishing between craft and profession, especially how it differs, differs for men and women in the spaces we think of when we talk about the two. In the domestic or female realm, woman is hobby keeper, homemaker, family cook. In the professional or male world, man is expert, money earner, chef, so on and so forth. It is not until the beginning of the industrialization of cheesemaking that we really start to see dairy work referred to as a profession, and what's more, a job that requires skill and intellect or higher education. There were many women who made, it, made, who made the cut into the professional world of dairying, but ultimately it was men's entrance that deemed it worthy of such title. Skills in the home come from inherited knowledge and traditions whereas professional skills come from higher education, science, reason. The problem with thinking about work in these ways is that it excludes much labor from being taken seriously as work and worthy of compensation. It was when men began to see butter and cheese, not as just crafts, part of domestic markets, but as true commodities and viable items for external markets that they began to take real interest in dairying. One of the things I hope to achieve with this project is to illustrate the globally and culturally shared experiences of women in dairy, even in places that don't typically get thought of when discussing dairy cultures. Mexico, while it is in fact a country with an incredible dairy culture, is shamefully underrepresented in this country. In May, I had the opportunity to go to Oaxaca City, where I did my best to absorb and observe the women there, considering my Spanish is quite limited. As I visited the many mercados throughout the city, I noticed that nearly every quesaria or cremeria was helmed by a woman, and many were even named after a woman. In some cases, the cheeses being sold were in fact made by the woman selling them, but no matter, they could all sell with skill and efficiency with the swiftness of any experienced market worker. There is still much more I would like to learn about cheeses and the women who make and sell them in Mexico, because I know for a fact there are incredible women doing incredible things on various scales. At this past ACS, it was great to meet Jess and Georgina from Lactography and Gabriela from Del Rebano in person. And they held a fantastic Mexican cheese and mezcal tasting with Julia Gross. In my, research, in my search to find a cheesemaker, I came upon Dona Rosa in Etla, just north of Oaxaca City. Etla is the home of Quesillo, in fact, the origin story, myth really, like many great cheeses, claims that a distracted young girl forgot to tend to the curds properly and in an attempt to hide her mistake, cover the curds with hot water, thus creating that perfect pasta filata stretch. I found Dona Rosa through a Google search and despite the listing, her shop has no clear demarcation and only after I asked around for her was I directed to what I would, what I would find to be her home. After asking in my broken Spanish if I could watch her make cheese, Viennes, she said, and led me outside through a screen door. In the most simple of setups, there was a tank, maybe 50 plus gallons, nearly the size of Rosa herself, atop a small unlit burner, where curds had already set. The space was far from any sanitized and technological make room, but had all the necessities for Rosa to do her work. I watched Rosa begin to move about her small workspace in a manner that spoke to the years, days, hours she has spent making cheese. Swift and agile, the mark of any experienced cheesemaker. As far as my understanding goes, the curds, which were already set, were made using rennet and had been resting for about 30 minutes. As I missed the beginning of her day and I didn't understand her response very well, I'm not sure where she gets her milk but Etla is far more rural than Oaxaca City, 
In fact, there were roosters and horses on the other side of her workspace. So I'm assuming it didn't travel far. She broke the curds by stirring them with a wooden pole into no specific size and then began to separate the curds and whey. I stayed with Rosa for about two hours, over the course of which she made two rounds of panela, several queso fresco, packed out a quesan, and one round of quesillo. Rosa, who learned from her mother and her abuela, worked with rhythm and second nature. Cool water was added when needed, and curds were tested on the back of her hand for salt. Josiah Twomley, surely rolling in his grave. If you're not familiar, Mr. Twomley arguably did improve modern cheese making methods, thanks in large part to experienced dairy maids, who he in turn had no problem denigrating for their practices. As science moved in, methods used by experienced dairy maids, such as using touch to test the set of curd, were looked down upon as inaccurate and resulting in a poor make. Back to Rosa. As she poured buckets of whey, I told her, tu es fuerte, to which she replied, not as much as her mother. Later, as she began to pack out rounds of queso fresco, her daughter, Abby, joined her, at one point letting her know that the queso fresco con chiles was muy picante, so Rosa mixed in more curd. Abby explained in Spanish that Rosa has many customers and also relies on tourists coming to see her make cheese, thanks to that same Google listing I found. Spending time with Dona Rosa filled me, filled me with much joy and my heart was so full after our afternoon together. For me, it felt like the kind of bonding I often experience with women over work and especially in the kitchen. The way Rosa would scrape a bowl with her hands with a spoon reminded me so clearly of my mother's movements in the kitchen when I watch her cook. Rosa welcomed me into her space so warmly and openly and this space was not just her workplace, but her home. There's this ever-present theme that for women, the role and space of homemaker blends and bleeds into other work and other spaces. As I mentioned previously, this has historically been the case in women's dairy work, and we have seen it with each woman I have introduced to you today. Rosa literally steps in and out of the home and the workplace, and they are one and the same. The fact that Rosa makes cheese quite literally out of her home should not change the way we think about her work though. This is no hobby. Rosa makes cheese two times a day and amongst her workspace were detailed notes of a businesswoman, market locations and quantities of cheese. Craft of course can be a positive word. You are a craftsman skilled in something, but it can also be used to describe a pastime that may not be taken all that seriously, particularly in regards to women and something made in the home. Because much of the labor women do does not exist within an office or a professional setting or is not equipped with machinery and technology, it is not acknowledged as true work and linked to professionalism. But Rosa not only feeds her family, she supports her family through her skill and knowledge. And beyond that, she supports and feeds her community and local economy. Women's ability to turn milk into a value added products as part of their housework was undeniably important to the economic well being of not only the family, but the community, and in some cases, the economic health of a country at large. Deborah Fink notes on the importance of women sharing dairy knowledge and skills over generations in regards to the rural economy. In fact, some feudal payments were made in the form of butter produced by women. Not only did women's dairy products sustain a family through literal sustenance, it also provided the family with income to purchase other needs. The value added model of dairying is not only practical, but has proven itself crucial over centuries in regards to supporting economic health. And now we'll go back to Nancy. It was such a joy to reconnect with Nancy over a phone call this past spring, especially now that I had the knowledge to engage in a deeper conversation. And she was so open and giving during our conversation. Before we got into it, Nancy shared that it had been about nine years since she had to halt her production as the FDA had found listeria cells on her wooden aging boards. She was also sure to make clear that she doesn't mind being regulated. It's a matter of having more clearly defined rules and expectations from FISMA and the FDA that small operations can look to for guidance and resources. It's maddening, she says, 
that the costs of testing in certain infrastructure weigh much larger on small businesses and the relative cost is way beyond what it would be proportionally for a larger business. Despite this huge setback, it was incredible to hear how much hope Nancy still has. She intends to get back into it and believes that small-scale value-added dairying is still a viable path and the idea of it continues to capture her interest. Nancy grew up on her family's Tabor Hill farm that was started in 1919 by her grandfather, who was a sharecropper, and the dairy was started in 1950. In 2000, when she was beginning to plan her operation, her two older brothers were running the dairy. She noted that the business had survived the 80s when a lot of businesses were going out, but it was getting harder and harder and there was less money to reinvest in the farm. Her intention was that through value added processing to be able to pay them a sustainable price for the milk. To get her business up and running, Nancy, Nancy connected with an experienced Dutch cheesemaker named Jan Buzakam who was interested in what was going on in the American artisanal cheese world. Buzakam taught Nancy how to make raw milk born cost style goudas. Unfortunately, they met several bumps along the way and by the time they were ready to open in 2006, his visa was set to expire and it was denied renewal so he returned to Europe. Nancy persisted though and opened Bronson Hill Treasury making three cheeses, Schuyler, Age Schuyler and Redneck. Not only was it great to reconnect with Nancy, it was fun to find and reread my project from 14 years ago, almost like reading a childhood diary. Words, phrases, and methods that likely meant little to me then now resonated and excited me. Perhaps most striking to me though, is that I suppose this reverence for women goes back as far as I can remember. I quote myself, Nancy, a mother of two, does every aspect of the labor intensive and precise process. She makes cheese two to three days a week and commits the others to managing the business and taking care of her family. And I took great care to note how busy she keeps herself with various tasks throughout her make day and the strenuous labor she undertakes for being such a petite woman. Uh, I am reminded of the awe I held for her. In my reporting, Nancy mentions many of the household things she would also like to take care of, such as tidying the kitchen and fixing up the guest room. But at the end of the day, sometimes all she wanted to do was put up her feet. Once Nancy and I had re revisited what I had vaguely remembered from when we first met, we talked a bit more generally about the current state and future of dairy and her experience as a woman. Nancy was shut down after eight years of operation and her brother sold off the family cows a couple years after that. As I mentioned, though she still has great hope and believes that small grass-based dairy is the right model sustainably, economically, environmentally, and for the community. In her opinion, greater Northeast grass-based dairy is a sensible use of animal agriculture and can create a circular economy. And in contrast to that, she does not think that a big operation is the way to go. Her cousins up the road have around 10 to 12,000 cows, and while she respects that they're doing well and making money, she can't help but see the flaws. We spoke of how the beginning, at the beginning of the pandemic, hit the market hard, how farmers were dumping milk. She keenly observed that large dairies face fragility in water supply, labor supply, manure management, and fuel costs. And they sell one product, milk, which is a such a volatile product. She noted that with a smaller farm, you might not be able to make as much money as fast, but you can find a way to just serve your neighbors in ways to hang in there in times of extreme economic stress. Like many, Nancy wants to see things move in the direction of more organic, more sustainable methods, and she does not find large scale operations attractive or resilient. Small is the more resilient direction we should be supporting, she says. More and more, she feels that people are looking to clean air, land, access to the outdoors, and a rural life can provide that, but you need to be able to make a living and value added can do that. While she did not ascribe these characteristics solely to women, Nancy reflected that animal husbandry requires somebody who is calm and sensitive to a creature that cannot express their needs. Entrepreneurship, which farming is a type of entrepreneurship, 
requires somebody who is creative and observant, keeping an eye out for trends and for opportunities. And she noted that something about being a parent, particularly a mother, lends itself to these things. But ultimately, it is a personality characteristic. Compassion and creativity and pragmatism. These are just certain things that are required to do a good job, she said. This was not the first time I had heard this expressed from any of the women I've talked to. I personally do think these are traits commonly inherent in women. If not biologically, certainly they are socialized into us, but perhaps that is a whole other conversation. As a mother, one thing that was helpful for Nancy about having the business when her kids were little was that it was a home-based business, literally feet from the house so she could be around her kids and be available to them and still be doing something fun and interesting which was a big deal for her. She also liked being able to give them that kind of rural upbringing to her kids too. And by around five and seven, they would help her at the farmer's market. Nancy has faced many obstacles. Near the end of our chat, she brought up that she was now divorced from her husband and that as a woman, it was really painful for her when she got shut down because it was starting to take off. And that was her ticket out of a bad marriage. And then they shut her down. She reflected that it is a challenge if your relationship is no good and you're dependent on the other person's income. It's really difficult to correct it. This made me think of how dairying has provided a great source of autonomy and independent means of earning income for women throughout history. Prior to industrialization, cheese and butter making allowed women to not only support their families with their earnings, but support themselves. And then later, until they were almost entirely excluded, women could be hired in cheese factories to continue to earn a living. Women are capable of so much if only to overcome the innumerable obstacles they may face. After hearing the troubles that Nancy has been through, it was incredibly encouraging and inspiring to hear her passion and hope. One that instills in you the faith that yes, there are kindred spirits and like-minded people out there. And she is just one woman amongst the many out there with the same spirit, drive, and intelligence. I hope you have all enjoyed hearing about Jess, Rosa, and Nancy as much as I have enjoyed getting to meet them. I cannot express enough how happy and honored I feel to have this platform to share the stories of, of women who otherwise might not get to speak to such a broad audience. When I think about the history of women in dairy, I cannot help but see how their stories resonate and carry on this legacy of skilled and experienced businesswomen and entrepreneurs who contribute to not just their families, but their communities and the culture at large. Their passion, resilience, and intelligence fills me with awe, and I would think it hard for you not to feel the same way. To go back to what I mentioned at the start of this talk, I've been thinking a lot about how rewarding and fulfilling this opportunity has been. So many have reached out to me to share their experiences and engage in this discussion and internet connections have turned into real life con connections. And in fact, just last month, I got to connect in real life with Pamela Rubio, who is currently in France doing a stage at Hervé Mons. Pame, who is Mexican, recently was back in Mexico and was herself able to go visit Dona Rosa and learn even more from her than I could. The fact that I get to, a part, get to be a part of this chain of connections gives me so much joy. I really could talk about women in dairy all day. Careful what you ask me because I just might ramble on and never stop. The DZTE board has been so helpful in their guidance and I look forward to continuing to share more and more at every opportunity because there is still an, an overwhelming amount to share and learn about. This is but a year's worth of research, and I firmly believe that this effort to learn about and to learn from women in dairy will be a lifelong pursuit. This global community truly is full of incredible people doing exciting, important work. Last fall, I was able to kick off my research by going to my first cheese in Bra, Italy, where I was able to attend a panel of women cheesemakers, La Donna del Latte, one day, perhaps there will be no need for specifically women-oriented and focused panels, for we will all have equal representation. But for now, count me in as one to highlight and uplift the work of women in any way possible, 
such as my participation in a new food zine called Feminist Food Journal. Their first issue was dedicated to milk and I was able to contribute alongside the wonderful Andy Watt from Jasper Hill, Karina Records, who's doing great work in Berlin and other parts of Europe, and Laura Gitlin of Villa Vilcula Farm. Before we move on to, dis to discussion, I'd like to share merely a few more select women who I think represent and reflect the distinct ways in which women are leading the future of this industry. They may not need my introduction, but as I have this platform, I'd like to say their names. The Women of Cheese Culture Coalition, Whitney Roberts, Ajayla Abdullah, Kira James, Nicole Garrett, Jamie Ping, and Lisa Lopez. These six carry on the tradition of women taking the lead in mutual aid and community work and education, and I believe their mission is key to sustaining this industry. They were recently featured on Vogue, and getting that kind of cross-recognition is major. And I also mentioned Kira's personal endeavors with Own Your Funk and her mission to make cheese accessible and enjoyable to everyone. Christine Clark of Your Cheese Friend. You can look to Christine for approachable and thoughtful commentary and articles on happening within and around the industry. And of course, her wonderful project which profiles members of this community. She has recently had to put the project on pause, but what an undertaking she achieved. Clara Diaz of Formaje in Spain. I have the utmost respect for Clara's dedication to illustrating how cheese is not only something to be enjoyed, but can be seen as a manifestation of a life ethos that carries through from the land, the animals, the producer to your table. Sarah Rowland of Bayou Sarah Farms in Louisiana, raising water buffalo and making natural cheese. It goes without saying that farming and cheese making is no easy endeavor and it is the spirit and commitment of a new generation of cheesemakers that will determine our future. You're going to want to keep an eye on what Sarah is doing. Caroline Hess, who is bringing her talents and spirit to distribution with her new venture, C. Hess Cheese. I mentioned Caroline not just because she is a dear friend, but because of her passion and commitment for her work and the genuine relationships she forges with her producers and customers. Just back in July, she was rain, raising money to start her business. And now two months later, she is full steam ahead with wholesale ordering open. I'm so proud of you, Caroline. This morning, I was listening to a podcast that was an interview with Sigourney Weaver. And this may seem rambor, uh, random, but she was talking about the significance of her role as Ripley in Alien. Speaking to her character's obstacles, Sigourney said, that's what women do. We do the stu tough stuff all the time. Of course, my ears perked up and I said to myself, yeah, we do. So on that note, I just want to say thank you to all the women doing the tough stuff and thank you for your work. Thank you to all of you for being here today. Uh, thanks everyone.